Now coming into 2019, we knew the midfield would be very, very close and tightly packed, but not as much as it actually has been. As at basically every race, we are unsure as to how the midfield is going to shake out because of how close it is. And that has led to a great first 12 races of 2019 in terms of entertainment from that midfield pack. And in today's video, I'm going to review the season so far for Renault, McLaren, Alfa Romeo, Haas, Racing Point, Toro Rosso, and of course the basement dwellers, Williams. And I'm going to look at why they find themselves in the positions they currently are in. So if you want to find out why they are currently in the positions they are in, then make sure to check out this video. So let's first start off with Renault, who had an okay preseason testing. Their car didn't look too great in testing to my eye when I was there at testing, but it was not too bad, and they were looking all right going into the first couple races. But coming into the season as a whole, Renault were expected to get into P4 on the constructors and run away from the midfield and start to bridge the gap between the midfield and the top teams. But this season, they've only really done that about three times. Shanghai, where they locked out the fourth row of the grid. Canada, that's probably their best performance of the season so far. And Silverstone, they were probably the quickest midfield team. But except for that, they have been really poor compared to how they should be. As the early part of the season was overshadowed by very small but annoying reliability issues, which cost the team plenty of points. But making the situation worse is that the car wasn't actually fundamentally that good of a car. And that was basically confirmed by the time we got to the Spanish Grand Prix where Renault's updates didn't really work and they didn't even finish in the points. But then things did start to improve from about Monaco up until their home Grand Prix and it looked as though that Renault were making progress, that Renault were getting back to the type of position that we expect them to be in and where they should be in the first place. And yes, even though Austria was a poor weekend at Silverstone, they had a good weekend there. But then the final two races before the summer break basically summarised their season so far. Not good enough. As at Hockenheim, the pace of the car was not good enough. And then in the race, two things happened which led to retirements for the two Renault cars that was commonplace for this team so far one with Daniel Ricciardo a reliability issue and then a driver error by Nico Hulkenberg that basically in terms of their issues does mostly sum up their season so far reliability has continuously held this team back and the drivers at times have done well but at other times they've underperformed compared to where they should be and all around, the Renault team, the drivers, everyone is not performing to standard. Especially when you consider the amount of money and resources this team has compared to teams like Toro Rosso, Haas and even Alfa Romeo who are now regularly beating them in the Grand Prix. And that is what is really leading to a very, very poor season. But when it does come to the drivers, even though I think the two drivers have room to improve, I think considering how the car has been, they have done pretty well so far. And when it comes to the battle between Daniel Ricciardo and Nico Hülkenberg, Hülkenberg has had his races where he has been better, but most of the time Daniel has come out on top. And I think Daniel has proved that so far he is the better driver and that is of course not a surprise we knew that coming into the season anyway but no matter what you think of the drivers they simply have not been given a good enough car to do what they want to do in the midfield and those drivers can only do so much in what is a mostly underwhelming mediocre car and because of the way they were in Hockenheim and Hungary and the way their first half of the season ended it's not looking good going into the rest of the season because I don't really see where Renault are going to be really greatly performing because their car again fundamentally just isn't really good enough for any type of circuit right now and at this point I don't think Renault are actually going to finish in the top five in the constructors and if they don't then Lots of changes need to happen at Renault because that is simply not acceptable. 
Hopefully Renault pick their pace up, but are they really going to? Probably not. But now let's get on to McLaren, who have had a great season so far, and this has probably been McLaren's best season since 2014. But if we go back to testing, things were not looking great for McLaren. Their car wasn't exactly eye-catching. It wasn't looking amazing to the eye. But it was definitely a step up on the awful 2018 McLaren. But by the time we got to the proper racing in the first couple races, such as Australia and Bahrain, McLaren showcased that they did actually fundamentally have a good enough car to be in the points at basically every Grand Prix. As by Bahrain, they were immediately with Lando Norris getting very strong points finishes. And that only continued at races such as Baku as well. But then came a key part of the season, the first few races of the European season. So at the Spanish Grand Prix and the Monaco Grand Prix, McLaren were not as good as they were in Bahrain and Baku. But that wasn't exactly a surprise. Because on low drag circuits this season, McLaren have been very, very good. But it seemed as though once we got to Canada, for example, on a low drag circuit compared to Renault, their midfield rivals, their car wasn't that good. And they looked as though they had taken a slight step back compared to Renault. But at Paul Ricard, everything started to go in the right direction as McLaren from then on basically had, most times out of 10, the best car in the midfield. As at Paul Ricard and Austria, they clearly had the best midfield car. Silverstone, they didn't have the best midfield car, but it was still good enough to finish in the points. And in Hockenheim, even though, again, it wasn't the best midfield car, they were still well enough in there to get a good amount of points with Carlos Sainz in P5. But in Hungary, in my opinion, came McLaren's best race of the season so far because they came to a circuit that was not really that suiting of their car and they dominated at the front of the midfield. They locked out the fourth row and Carlos Sainz finished in P5 and beat a Red Bull and a Mercedes of Valtteri Bottas. And that race really did showcase not only the progress of McLaren in the last year or so, but also how they progressed over the season. And that result in Hungary really did cap off a great first 12 races for McLaren. And these stats right here do show the progress that has been made. By the time we got to the summer break in 2018, McLaren had 52 points and they were P7 in the constructors. But right now, at the summer break of 2019, they have 82 points and they are P4 in the constructors. And they are definitely going to finish in P4 in the constructors. But we cannot deny that the two drivers, Carlos Sainz and Lando Norris, the new best partnership in Formula 1 in terms of entertainment, both of these drivers have been very, very good. Carlos Sainz has been one of the top six or seven best drivers on the grid. Most times out of ten, he has got the most at the McLaren car. And especially in the last three or four races, he has been exceptional in that McLaren car. And he has really showcased to Red Bull on a personal level the mistake that Red Bull made in not selecting him for that team over Pierre Gasly. Now Lando, for me, has been at times very, very good. But I don't think when it has mattered most in the race, he has quite had enough pace and has been as good as his teammate Carlos Sainz. I think when it comes to qualifying, Lando is very good. But he does need to work on is say pace in the race and also consistency because Carlos at the moment seemingly has that nailed down to a T. But despite that, he has been great. Carlos Sainz has been great and so have the team. And even if the final nine races are not amazing for the McLaren team, they are going to finish P4 in the constructors. And for me, that is a very, very successful season and hopefully they do finish off with P4 as McLaren are now starting to rebuild. Now let's get on to the rest of the midfield and first off Alfa Romeo. Now in testing, Alfa were not looking amazing, but they were looking pretty good compared to teams like Renault, Haas, Racing Point and even McLaren. And once the racing did finally get underway, in the first four races before we got to Europe, Alfa did have probably the fourth or fifth best car on the grid. 
as Kimi Raikkonen especially was very good and consistently getting those very very important points finishes. But then came the Spanish Grand Prix where Alpha did like a couple other teams take a bit of a step back because basically updates on their car simply didn't work. Meaning that, in, meaning that in Spain, Monaco and Canada, they weren't really that noteworthy. But then they brought some updates to the French Grand Prix at Paul Ricard and ever since then, up until the Hungarian Grand Prix, Alpha were back to how they were in the first four races and again, they probably do have one of the top five cars on the grid. And because the Alpha car had finally improved again, that allowed Kimi Raikkonen to continue with his great performances and points finishes in Paul Ricard, Austria, Silverstone, Hockenheim, even though he did get a penalty, he was still very good, and of course, Hungary. And because they made those updates and are now improving, going into the final nine races, I think Alpha definitely can get a top five constructors finish, but that really is down to the drivers, honestly. Not necessarily Kimi Raikkonen, because Kimi has been great this season, and I think Kimi has consistently been one of the best midfield drivers. But it really does come down to mostly Antonio Giovinazzi because despite a couple races such as Hockenheim and Austria, he hasn't been on race day good enough to really finish in the points and he does have to improve his race pace because if Alpha are going to finish in the top five in the constructors for sure, which they really should be, Antonio's race pace has to improve and when it comes to the comparison between these two of course Kimi Raikkonen has been massively better and that is not really a surprise we thought that coming into the season anyway Antonio's qualifying against Kimi Raikkonen at times has been pretty good but most of the time Kimi has been number one at Alpha but as I said if Antonio can improve his performance and Kimi can keep doing what he is doing they can absolutely, Alfa Romeo, finish in the top five in the Constructors. And if they do, Antonio, you know, improves and Kimi keeps up his current performance. I think Alfa absolutely will beat Renault and beat Toro Rosso to P5 in the Constructors. And hopefully for them, they do do that because they've had a good season and I think they would honestly deserve it. Next up, though, is Haas F1, who have had a very, very weird season. At the start of the season, around testing in the first Grand Prix, Haas had probably the best car in the midfield, not massively over other midfield rivals, but they probably were right there at the front of the midfield. But then, once we got to races such as Shanghai and Baku, once they started to update the car, the car was really just getting worse. Yes, in Spain and Monaco, Haas' car did improve because they did bring some new updates to the Spanish Grand Prix, but the results they got were not the best it could have been, and that's really the story of Haas' season. Qualifying has been great, but in the race, they have not achieved what they should have with the car they do have, and they have lost a monumental amount of points through errors from drivers and also just poor tyre wear and poor race pace. And the worst part of their season was from about Canada up until the British Grand Prix. As from Canada to the British Grand Prix, they had most of the time, even in qualifying, little to no pace. And on race day, they were basically a no-show. They might as well have not even turned up. They were so bad. Even in Austria, they were at times slower than Russell and Kubica in the Williamses. And the whole rich energy saga was not helping either. And it was just causing Haas' season to go straight down the gutter. And the lowest point of Haas' season and their history was that 2019 British Grand Prix where... The pace of their car again was not good but both drivers on the first lap crashed into each other and they both retired because of it and that week because of their main title sponsor was just a nightmare but as we got to the summer break things actually did start to improve as pass with them splitting their drivers in terms of what spec of car they used actually made progress as Roman Grosjean in Hockenheim in Hungary and I think also Silverstone did go back to the old Australian Grand Prix spec car. 
whilst Kevin used the new spec Haas car. And in a big surprise, the old car was a lot better. And it led them to finishing the points for the first time in quite a while in Hockenheim. And in Hungary, even though they didn't finish in the points again because the race pace was not really there, their qualifying pace was a lot better than we were expecting at that certain track. So at least for Haas F1, coming into the summer break, things are actually improving and not getting worse. Because if they got any worse than Silverstone, then they might actually be finishing way at the back of the midfield in the constructors. But most of this season, you have to say, has not really been what Haas were hoping for. And also, they've not made progress on the issues they had from 2019, such as pace on the softer compound tyres and also tyre wear. Now, when it comes to the drivers, the drivers, I think, at times have actually done pretty well considering the car they have been given. And I think their performances have been at times wrongly criticised Again, because the Haas car at times has not been a good enough car for them to showcase how quick they were in those particular weekends. Roman Grosjean has made errors, but he has started to improve and that is nice to see from him. And I think Kevin Magnussen has actually had quite a good season. And in qualifying especially, Kevin has been amazing at times. But again, because of how poor the car is on race day, he cannot showcase how good he really is. So I think criticising them massively is not really right to do because, again, they don't have a good enough car on a race day to really showcase their true talent. But overall, as a team, I don't think, even though they are starting to make progress, I don't think Haas are anywhere near a position where they can consistently be in the points like they were at times in 2018. So... When it comes to Haas F1 for the rest of 2019 going into 2020, I think they have a lot of progress to make and a lot of work to do. And hopefully they do make progress because it would be a shame for Haas to just continue with this awful race pace that they do have. But now let's go on to Toro Rosso who have had a better season, a much better season than I was expecting coming into 2019 because coming into 2019... Given their lineup of, a, of drivers and given the car I thought they would have, I thought Toro Rosso would really just be a nothing type team in 2019. But in testing, their car actually looked pretty good. And in the first five or six races, Toro Rosso, one of the most consistent teams in the midfield in terms of finishing in the top 10. And because of that, that allowed Toro Rosso in the constructors to hang on to teams like Renault, Alfa Romeo and even Haas, even though at times in qualifying especially, their car was way, way faster than the Toro Rosso. And in those first six races, they did have some very good ones, such as Alexander Albon in Shanghai, of course, coming from the pit lane. But the best out of the first six races was probably Monaco, where Kvyat finished in P7 and Albon, of course, finished in P8. A great team result for Toro Rosso. But then for a couple races around Paul Ricard and Austria, they did fall off the pace and they really did take a step back. But then once we came to Silverstone, they made a step forward. As Albon during the weekend was a top 10 runner in qualifying and Kvyat did finish the points in that Grand Prix. Then we came to Hockenheim where in the dry in qualifying, Toro Rosso probably had the worst car. But in the wet, as usual, Toro Rosso were very good. And because of the way things worked out and the craziness of that Grand Prix, Daniel Kvyat got his first podium since 2016 and the team's first podium since Monza in 2008. And it really, really was a great day for Toro Rosso and they scored a massive 23 points. And if you add the point they got from Hungary with Albon, they are now P5 in the Constructors. And who would have thought they would be in that position by the summer break? I thought that would be honestly impossible for this team. But it has happened and it is really great news for us watching. Now for the two drivers, I think the two drivers have been good. I think Daniel has been better than Albon. Albon has had his good races such as Hungary, Shanghai, Monaco. Those have been good races but I think Daniel has been more consistent in how good he has been. For example in Spain he was very good. 
Monaco, he was very, very good. Hockenheim, even though his pace at times was not that special in the wet, he did very well to make the choice to go on to what tyres he did to get the podium, but also his pace to finish in P3 was very, very strong. So I have to commend him on that. And I think if you look at the season, most of the time, Daniel has been the better driver. And for Daniel, of course, that's very, very important because once Pierre Gasly is dropped by the end of this season, I think Daniel will be in that Red Bull for 2020. So as long as he keeps that up, I think Kvyat will be back where he really does deserve to be because he never deserved to be dropped from Red Bull Racing. But the big question with Toro Rosso is, can they maintain P5 in the Constructors? I don't think they can, but what if I'm wrong? Well, to be honest, I hope I am, because I want to see this team be in those types of positions, because they work so hard as a team, and they really do deserve a great finishing position for once in the Constructors. And hopefully for them, they do get it. And now let's get on to the final midfield team, Racing Point. And the best way to describe Racing Point's 2019 is lack of development. Because in testing, they had mostly a 2018 car. And in the first four races, their car aerodynamically was not that developed. But they were still scoring points. And at one point, they looked as though they were in a fight for P4 in the Constructors, especially after Baku, where they had both cars in the points. But then in a very similar fashion to Alpha, after the updates at Barcelona, Racing Point took a big step back. And from about Barcelona up until Hockenheim, they had the worst car in the midfield. Even though Lance Stroll in his home race finished in the points and it was a brilliant Grand Prix, most of the time, even though their race pace at times was really, really good, they were so bad in qualifying that they just weren't able to get close enough to get a points finish on race day. And because of their really bad qualifying performances, it has cost them a lot of points, I feel, in 2019 so far. At Hockenheim in Hungary, though, they did bring in bits and pieces their B-spec car. And I think they are definitely looking better going into the final nine races of 2019. But in Hungary, it wasn't the most positive weekend as they qualified very poorly. And in the race, even though in the first stint they were good with Sergio Perez, it wasn't the greatest race in terms of race pace. So I guess we'll wait and see on Racing Point once we do get into the final nine Grand Prix. For the two drivers though, I think both of them respectively in their own manner have done well. I think Sergio Perez has been the better driver than Lance Stroll. He's outqualified him every single Grand Prix, proving why Lance is so bad in qualifying. And I think most of the time in the races, Sergio has been better. In Melbourne, Lance did well. In Canada, Lance did well. In uh, Hockenheim, Lance did well. But in all the other races, I think Sergio was the better driver. So I think you have to say that Sergio Perez is absolutely the best driver at racing point. And the only way Lance Stroll can try and turn that around is to, for once, out-qualify Sergio Perez. Something he seemingly cannot do. And you have to remember, Sergio is not even that good when it comes to qualifying. Sergio... And his strength is really the race, is not qualifying. So I don't get why Lance is so bad compared to Perez when it comes to qualifying. But if the new parts can work in the final part of the season, then maybe Racing Point can start to slowly but surely climb up that constructor's table. And it would be nice to see, given how dismal Racing Point have been most of the time in the last few races, for them to be a consistent top 10 runner. And hopefully that is what they become. And now let's finally get on to Williams, who have been terrible. As for the entire season, I think Williams have had the worst car and they've not really gone anywhere in a hurry. In the last couple races before the summer break, they did make progress with their car and George Russell did put in a great performance in Hungary to show possible signs that Williams are actually going to join the midfield. But I don't think they will. I really don't think they will. They did score points at Hockenheim, but that was because of the two alphas getting their penalties. And I don't think the Williams is anywhere near a genuine point scoring finish yet. 
And if you are nowhere near a genuine point scoring finish, then we can't really call you a midfield team. So for me, Williams are not a part of the midfield yet and are still back markers. And when it comes to the drivers, well, there's no comparison. Yes, Robert Kubica has one point and Russell has none, but Russell has been way faster and he is absolutely the better driver. Just look at Hungary where Russell was 1.3 seconds quicker than Kubica. That is a clear sign that Russell is miles better than Robert Kubica. I know Robert Kubica fans out there are saying that Robert's car's broken and stuff like that. It isn't. It's not. Simply, Robert is not good enough compared to George Russell. Of course, Russell might be one of the best drivers on the grid. We don't know that. But if you compare Kubica to Russell, well, there isn't a comparison. Russell is miles, miles better. But before I go, let's look at the Constructors title standing. So Mercedes are heading towards another Constructors championship. We do have a good battle for P2 in the Constructors between Ferrari and Red Bull. McLaren are P4. I think they're going to get it because they're about 40 points clear of Toro Rosso, who I think will start to drop. Toro Rosso P5. Renault P6. I'm sorry, that is really poor. Alpha P7. Racing Point P8, Haas P9 and Williams P10. And I will say, if Renault don't start to improve, who knows? Maybe Alpha and Racing Point will catch and pass Renault in the Constructors. It could honestly happen. But with the first 12 races, the midfield has offered up some great battles, some great talking points and great racing in general. And hopefully for the rest of 2019, that will continue. And I think it's impossible for it not to. So here's to some more epic racing in 2019, not only in the midfield, but also at the very top as well. I cannot wait for these final nine races. And of course, with my reviews on a weekend and my watch alongs, you can catch it right here on my channel. But guys, that has been it for this mid-season review of the midfield. Make sure in the comments to let me know what you thought of this video and let me know what you thought of my opinion on the midfield so far in 2019. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. Bottom right of the screen, you can do it right there. Or go to my homepage, subscribe, and hit the notifications bell. And also smash the like button if you want to see this content continue on the channel. And also, guys, don't forget to join us tomorrow live at 3 p.m. UK time on the channel as me and Nib will be doing the podcast and we will complete the reviews of the season so far by looking at the races so far this season and how entertaining they have been in terms of the racing. So until then, guys, it has been me, Chazer HD. Goodbye.